Good morning. It's the 8th of November. Uh, yesterday, we had the race that stops the nation. Today, still, we're talking about a different type of race. Yeah, this is the drug that stops the whole world, um, namely uh, Byzantine for the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia being developed by Race Oncology. Um, so, uh, Mark, uh, our cousins at Pitt Street Research have written some uh, pretty good research on Race Oncology a few months ago. Uh, so I'll just recap uh, what this company does, and then we'll talk about the data they've just got. Uh, the first thing to notice is that uh, the race shareholders have not done well in uh, 2023. But Mark, take a look at the tail end of that chart. Middle of August till about now, that looks like a pretty good base building situation. Would you agree? Yeah, it's still range bound, uh, but it seems that the uh, maybe the downtrend has been broken. And yeah, consolidation is usually the first step to uh, finding uh, for a stock to find its way back up again. Right. Interest rates have been going up all around the world. We had an interest rate increase yesterday in Australia uh, to celebrate Cup Day with. Um, but the, the, the consensus is uh, that uh, the cycle is more or less peaked. When that happens, you're going to see uh, cash coming back into risk assets. And from an American perspective, uh, biotech is it. And uh, you can see the next slide, what I mean there. Um, that's the NASDAQ biotech index. Uh, had a pretty torrid uh, 2022 2023 wasn't much better, but um, it's it's recovered quite nicely in just the last few days. So uh, I'd want to see it uh, go a bit higher, but I think the downtrend that you can uh, uh, detect on that chart beginning in June is probably coming to an end. Um, so I'd watch that carefully, but uh, it, uh, it, what it means is potentially drug developers down here, like Race Oncology, have a shot at recovering in 2024. And Race's case, there's some decent uh, data and uh, um, a fair bit of maturity to back that up. So let's talk about race oncology. Uh, based here in Sydney, um, what do they do? Um, they're reprofiling an old cancer drug called Byzantine. Um, in drug development, reprofiling a drug is where you take a drug that was around for something else and reprofile it into something new. Um, it happens all the time uh, because uh, scientists have a habit of discovering new uses for particular drugs. By Byzantine is particularly uh, interesting. Um, in the 80s, it was the hot new thing. In, um, in, in certain cancers. Uh, and it was actually developed and put on the market in France by a, one particular uh, uh, drug company. But if you trace through the various uh, pharma merges that were going on in the 80s, um, this drug kind of disappeared from view. Um, and at the time, there were other drugs coming on the market for the treatment, well, not just of acute myeloid leukemia, but, but other cancers that looked better and safer. And so this kind of drug kind of uh, died uh, a death with no one really noticing it. However, a couple of guys did, Dr. John Rothman and Dr. Bill Garner over in the US. Bill Garner, I've known for a number of years, very talented uh, US bioentrepreneur. Um, they realized that this drug had died, but not because of any uh, serious problems with the drug. So they filed some new um, uh, patents around the use of Byzantine and then set to work with the reprofiling exercise. Race Oncology was the uh, fruits of that. They took it public on ASX in July 2016. The IPO at the time was 20 cents. And Mark, if you dig through um, uh, through the internet, you might find the research report that I wrote in 2016, which would support that effort way back at 20 cents. So I've got quite a history with this company. Um, meantime, uh, thanks to uh, uh, some pretty good clinical data and other things, the stock's actually re-rated quite nicely. It made it to 370 back in 2021. Come back since then is now a buck two, uh, but it's it's holding pretty steady in that channel we saw a few um, uh, a few charts ago. Um, what's good right now? Well, um, uh, the phase two data that they've been collecting in acute myeloid leukemia, leukemia looks interesting. Um, a lot of the early work on this company, in fact, the, the, the original data that um, propelled the stock into the stratosphere was done by the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv in Israel. They've gone back and, and run a, uh, another study where they've combined Byzantine with, with two standard of care drugs, fludarabine and uh, clofarabine. Uh, and what they're finding is a decent response rate in patients with advanced uh, relapse or re refractory. So once you get to re relapse and refractory, um, there's, uh, you're getting pretty sick. So to get a response in these kind of patients is quite good. But the important thing is this. And the reason why uh, uh, the founders of Race picked this, this uh, idea up um, back in the last decade or so, the drug has no cardio uh, cardiotoxicity. A lot of drugs will cause a lot of damage to the heart. They'll treat the cancer, but they'll also uh, shorten your life through, um, uh, through, through weakening the heart muscles. This drug doesn't have that problem. And so when you combine it with the fact that uh, you're getting such good responses, uh, Byzantine actually has a decent future. 
uh, and, uh, and and that of data will be presented at the uh, American Society of Hematology meeting, which happens next month in, in San Diego. So, Mark, can I um, take some money out of our account and fly to San Diego to attend the uh, American Society of Hematology conference? Because this sounds interesting. Yeah, you can. Only if I can join you for some beach volleyball on Mission Beach. <laughs> so if there's any um, uh, hematology conferences in less salubrious uh, locations, I guess I'm going alone, right? <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> All right. You're saying budget hotels as well. <laughs> And flying cargo <laughs> holds. So. <laughs> All right. So um, now this is where it, it, the story gets a little bit, uh, I won't say complicated, but uh, th there are a few nuances that you need to appreciate as to why this story is so powerful. And the first one is FTO. Um, FTO stands for fat mass and obesity associated protein. Um, biologists have a way of naming molecules um, for all sorts of interesting properties. Um, uh, it turns out, as you can appreciate, this um, this particular molecule was associated with fat and obesity. Um, when scientists looked at the particular molecule, they also found it was it was a, a cancer marker. When that uh, particular protein was was messed about with, it was causing certain kinds of cancers. Um, long after race went public, the mechanism of action of the drug working via this FTO protein uh, was identified. And, it, and once you, you understand the mechanism of something, you can go look at other cancers where this is relevant and, and spread the uh, usage of the drug around. Um, so, so the thing to understand about race, uh, acute myeloid leukemia is not necessarily where it's at. This has become quite a well-treated drug, in, uh, a well-treated uh, cancer in the last seven years or so. Um, so it's less and less likely that, that, um, that, that patients will die of acute myeloid leukemia in the future. And those patients who get it will have longer um, uh, five-year survival or higher levels of five-year survival. Um, in this data that the Shima Medical Center just uh, gathered, um, uh, those patients did well enough to, to uh, in many cases, go into a bone marrow transplant. Once you get a bone marrow transplant in a disease like AML, you're potentially cured. Um, so, uh, uh, so the, the, that's, that's just uh, one piece of data. Um, there are other drugs out there that are really good for AML. So, uh, it's getting a little bit crowded to think of Byzantine as being useful in, in AML, although it probably is useful given the, um, the, the fact that it acts against cardiotoxicity. What the company is talking about now is going after other cancers, in particular metastatic breast cancer, uh, where some of the other drugs that are treated for, for that indication are actually cardiotoxic. Um, you could select for, for uh, women whose breast cancer was FTO positive, and so you'd have a, sub, uh, a subgroup potentially that could do quite well. Uh, with this disease. That, that's what's um, being explored at the moment. But the phase two data uh, gives you more comfort factor that this company is not headed for a clinical failure. It's really just got to pick the indications going after correctly. And I think that's what the market is saying in terms of where the share price is. Uh, they're not going to market down any, any further. And they're probably waiting for a good excuse to re-rate this one given uh, the, the power of the drug. All right. And so everything in life sciences takes forever, right? Right. Um, so the obvious question is, how, what, what, what does the balance sheet look like? And, and they, they probably need some more capital, right? Before they, yeah, they, uh... they've, they've got enough cash to, 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 um, to, to go for a while because they raised a fair bit um, back when, um, when the stock re-rated uh, quite heavily, 2020, 2021. Um, they obviously will be back for more in the future. So you, you need to time that one carefully. The, um, uh, the, the, the pathway here is how fast they can get onto some of these um, uh, newer indications. And that, that will then drive a fair bit of news flow. So um, if you don't own the stock, I mean, I'd, I'd be careful buying it right now until until it, it became clear what the, the, the pathway was going forward. But I think it's a very interesting story. Now, analyst bias, Mark, you know me very well. I never met a biotech I didn't like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why everyone in the biotech sector likes me, because I'm more inclined to say nice things about them than, uh, than, than unkind things. Um, but I can see a lot of good, um, good, good qualities in this one. And there's a reason why it's re-rated from the, the lowly levels of 20 cents that it was IPO'd back in 2016. All right, good stuff. Um, now to another sector where stuff usually takes quite long if you're developing new things, which is the, the chip industry. And the reason to have a look at that one is because the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, which is basically the, the, the index to look at if you want to keep track of how chip stocks are doing, that's actually gone up uh, quite nicely very recently. So, so, so Mark, question... are you sure about this? This like th things take forever. I go into the grocery store all the time, and when I get to the chip section, there's always something new on the shelves. Yeah, and then nice flavors as well, right? Right. <laughs> oh, so we're talking about uh, uh, semiconductors here, right? Definitely. Or yeah. I really better to pay attention. Um, so let's have a look at the Philadelphia Semiconductor in in Index. So socks for short. What is it? It's 30 U.S. listed stocks, the chip stocks. 
uh, semiconductor stocks for uh, those who didn't get that the first time around, Stuart. <laughs> um, well, and why these is are called the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. Uh, it was created back in 93, probably in Philadelphia. I have no clue. NASDAQ owns it. Um, and it's a good indicator of how the industry is doing, at least in terms of share prices. Um, it's uh, You have to be listed in the US to be part of this group, um, but you don't have to be a US company. So if you look at that list over there, uh, most uh, of them are US based, US companies, but AML is Dutch, TSMC is Taiwanese. Um, and Wolfspeed is European as well, right? Wolfspeed is, is a US based company, right. okay. but they've got facilities in, in uh, Europe. Um, so and Global Foundries is basically the, the, the product of uh, a few uh, mergers and spin-offs over the years, but uh, they all, they're all listed in, uh, in the US, but they're not, not all, uh, they don't all have their own chip facilities. For instance, NVIDIA, Broadcom, those are fabulous chip companies. Um, so they design the chips and then have companies like TSMC manufacture them for them or Global Foundries. That's another, that's another uh, chip foundry. ASML is an equipment company, same as applied material. So it's a whole mixed bag and, and good sort of cross section of the industry. And uh, just w one more uh, uh, question to satisfy my curiosity. How come Taiwan is so good at semiconductors? You talk about TSMC, but that's not the only player. There are others. And uh, a lot of the fabs that the, the, these fabulous companies we're talking about are based in Taiwan. What's the secret of their success? Well, if you go back in time, um, the semiconductor technology emerged out of the US, uh, but it was used, technology itself was used also to help uh, certain Asian countries post post uh, Second World War, so in the 60s and 70s, to uh, to help them in their uh, in their economy. So Japan, Korea, Taiwan were all companies that quickly adopted the technology. You got licenses from US companies, including Intel and Fairchild Semiconductor. Um, and they built up their own uh, industries and they did it so well uh, that in some instances, like in the, with the case of uh, TSMC, it's now the biggest foundry in the world. They, they did it so well that they basically surpassed their, uh, their US peers over time. Right. Uh, Uncle Sam's not going to be so helpful in the future, right? Well, Uncle Sam is, uh, this is a di different discussion, but Uncle Sam is, uh, is, is implementing a, a few restrictions on, uh, at least you know, on China, uh, but that's a whole different discussion. Right. Um, so the SOX, this, is, this goes back to inception, 94, it was first traded. You can see it's had a, quite a nice run from, uh, from the GFC uh, onward. And of course, you can see the dot-com bubble in there. The chip stocks were, uh, were, were uh, booming. 9-11 in there, uh, of course, the COVID crash. But you can see in hindsight how short-lived all these, uh, these crashes were, right? So because chips, semiconductors, are uh, the pro proliferation of that has uh, only accelerated over the last sort of 15, 20 years, my bet that going forward, say until 2040, 2050, uh, the, the sector will keep on on this trajectory where any crash, any any pullback will be relatively short lived um, because uh, yeah, there's just too much demand. Uh, semiconductors power everything these days. And uh, and so the sector will benefit from that in the next in the next couple of decades. So if we look at more recently, so this is this goes back to last year. Uh, so 2022 was a horrific year, same as for, for life sciences. Interest rates in March of 22 uh, were jacked up by the by the Fed. So this entire sector has come down. Um, it's, it's bounced back since late last year. Um, but right now, after that initial recovery, there is a bit of uh, there was a bit of uh, doubt, I'd say, um, about where you know the interest rates are going, how the U.S. economy is, is, is playing out, um, I think. We're probably looking at peak interest rates for the U.S., maybe not Australia, but definitely for the U.S. Um, and so you can see just in the last week or two that the, the SOX has actually recovered. It's still, you know, still in that downtrend. But my guess is that we'll, we'll be very close to the end of that downtrend uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the key reasons, obviously, is, is that the sector fundamentals seem to be improving. Um, so if you look at the, the major uh DRAM manufacturers so SK Hynix for instance is one of them uh, but also uh flash memory Samsung is a big player in that um they've been seeing price improvements for about two months now uh, and so the, the the articles that you see on the left those are from yesterday um basically what they're saying is look we've seen very weak demand recently we cut back production but now our inventories are back to well, getting lower and lower, and we're now seeing price increases, and that's actually led to a nice sort of mini mini bull run in uh, in some of these chip stocks. And actually, this morning, Global Foundries came out with uh, with great results as well, and this, that stock is booming as well now. So 
what you're seeing is that the initial mover in this market is always memory. Memory is always the first to move when things go up or down. Uh, and we're now seeing memory prices starting to improve. And Why, is my that? Why does memory move first? Oh, it's, it's just a uh, very boom bust type uh, dynamic. The production dynamics are very different from, from logic, which is the other big uh, segment of the, the, the semiconductor market. Logic is uh, sort of, you know, the smart chips, if you will. Memory is just for storage. And it's basically commodity. So as soon as there's overcapacity, uh, you'll see prices come down really hard, uh, but also the other way around. When, when there's shortages, these prices just, just spike. So um, it's really a, a leading indicator for the logic market. So I think early next year, early 2024, we'll see logic uh, following as well. And that could potentially be supported by initial rate cuts in the US, uh, which, will be, which will be good for equities in general, but also you know, in terms of, of risk profiles, you'll see probably some money flow back to, to the semiconductor industry. So in an environment like that, where we're really on the, on the cusp of a recovery of the next upcycle in semiconductors, what stocks do we like? Well, it's, it's, it's usually safe to go with the leaders in their field. And so in, in three respective fields, equipment, Fabless and Foundry, we like uh, we like ASML, chip, the, the leading one of the leading chip uh, equipment manufacturers, and the, the monopolist when it comes to lithography, which is a key manufacturing step in semiconductors. Yeah, Nvidia, good to invest in a monopoly. What's that? Always good to invest in a monopoly. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so Nvidia, everyone these days knows Nvidia, uh, the leader in AI. Uh, chips. It's a fabulous chip company, and TSMC does most of their, if not all of their, production work. Uh, TSMC is the largest foundry, um, and it does. It's it's by far the leader in uh, in most advanced production as well. So at, at three nanometers. So uh, just briefly on on ASML, this is the best company you've never heard of as a regular Aussie investor, but it's definitely one that you want to be aware of uh, because if you look at the chart on the left there. You can see that the, the the improvements the company's made in terms of share price, but that's all driven by the fact that it's the by far the technology leader in lithography, which is a production step to print uh, the the the, uh, the the chip patterns on silicon. And we won't go into that now, but that's a clear leader in its uh, in its field. It's got eighty percent. Uh, market share in deep UV, and it's a monopolist in EUV, which is the most advanced production equipment. So if you're a chip manufacturer, you have to go ASML uh, if you want to be competitive. Um, 24 is, will likely be a transition year in terms of, um, in terms of the numbers, uh, because it's coming down still. People have pushed out their uh, equipment orders for 23 that will likely persist uh, into, into 24, not the whole year, but coming into 24, we'll still see some weakness. But if you look at 25, uh, the valuation is insanely attractive in my book because for this um, monopolist in EUV, you're only paying 0.44 on the uh, beloved EBITDA to EBITDA growth metric, which is uh, really, really low in my book. Um, the biggest risk here is that ASML sees a big chunk of their China business disappear because of the more restrictions that are coming in. So uh, Trump a couple of years ago limited uh, or basically had the Dutch government ban ASML from exporting EUV, which is the most advanced equipment. But the Biden government has come back and said, look, guys, you can also not you should not really export uh, the most advanced deep UV uh, technology. So that's coming into effect later this year. And if you look at ASML's revenues in 2023, you can see the China portion of that really growing because all these manufacturers in China were uh, hastily getting, you know, ordering new uh, tools from ASML before these restrictions kick in. Right. So next year, that will be a lot less. But if you look at the chart on the right, that's more the short term chart. We think uh, this, def this one can definitely go back to the upper uh, range of that trend line, which is above $1,000. This is the, uh, the NASDAQ uh, listed version of ASML. It's also listed in Europe, Euronex, but this is the US. So there's a lot of upsides. And it's in my book, if you buy this one, you, you should be good for another 10, 20 years with this one because it's simply the, the most advanced uh, must have equipment out there in the market for uh, lithography. So, Mark, would you say that the uh, Biden administration's restrictions, when they were announced, uh, were actually a great buying opportunity? Because you, you could get the sense they would grow beyond that that temporary restriction. Yeah, look, it's a bit of a mixed bag because you'll see some, some China business disappear. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the effects of uh, the CHIPS Act, uh, which basically says, look, we need more onshore production of chips. We need to pull it back from Taiwan because of the risks uh, of China uh, invading that at some point. 
Um, what that means is that a lot of manufacturing is now going back to the US, to Europe, to Japan and to Korea, right? So away from, from Taiwan, still owned in large part by TSMC, but it, it's setting up fabs outside of Taiwan, which means that if you're not sort of centralized in Taiwan, uh, so these, these fabs are more dispersed, you're less efficient. You still need all these tools from all these equipment manufacturers. So for equipment manufacturers like ASML, uh, it's actually not that bad, but that's in the in the longer term, right? When, once these fabs are close to being uh, outfitted with equipment, so give it another two or three years. Um, so you'll, you'll have more diversification in terms of where chips are produced uh, in the long term. And that in itself, I think is, a, is probably good for, for chip equipment companies. Okay. So NVIDIA, everyone knows NVIDIA because of the spikes earlier this year. Um, the company far exceeded its own guidance and uh, the share price spiked. Uh, it's a market leader in uh, graphic chips, but um, these chips, and if you look, go back to the chart, uh, this is a sort of 2015, 2016. If you look at the chart on the left, go back in time a bit. Um, a lot of these chips uh, were all of a sudden used for Bitcoin mining. Initially, they're, they're graphic <laughs> chips for, for gaming. But Bitcoin miners found out that these uh, GPUs are very efficient in processing data, their data, right? So in mining Bitcoin. Uh, so all of a sudden, you see in the chart there, NVIDIA shares are taking off because uh, you know, they're selling more of these uh, these GPUs into the, the mining Bitcoin mining sector, I should say. Um, but more recently, they've also been, uh, well, a couple of years ago, they, uh, the, the artificial intelligence applications of, of these chips have also come into, into focus. And that's what's really driving the share price at the moment. Um, of course, you can use these, these, these chips for everything from gaming, data centers, automotive, industrial, et cetera. But AI is the big sort of driver at the moment. And if you look at the revenue projections from this year to 2025, it's uh, compounded or the average one for, for those two years is 72%, which is massive, of course. And EBITDA is expected to grow more, almost 400% next financial year, uh, which starts in, in February. And then again, coming back to our preferred valuation metric, uh, EBITDA to EBITDA growth, you're, you're paying 0.1%. Uh, basically, uh, for this one, which is extremely low, uh, because we're in, in, in that metric, we basically relate the valuation to the growth that you're buying for that valuation. Uh, and so it's, it's really low in my book. Uh, still for, for 25, 2025, it's, it's only 0.7. Anything below one is, is pretty attractive. But yeah, in this case, uh, it's, it's, is 0.1 for next year and 0.7 for 25. So I think that looks looks really good. Um, the, the key risk with this one is because they don't manufacture their own chips, they're dependent on companies like TSMC to do that for them. If these foundry partners can keep up with all the demand, um, especially next year when I think we'll see a recovery in logic chips, uh, so the demand for foundry capacity will increase. And the question then is, yeah, you know, where does all that, um, all the demand, where is that being manufactured? And so it might be a bit tight for capacity not early next year, but maybe later on in the year. Um, but yeah, that's a risk to keep in mind. I think for now, uh, looking at the, the right-hand chart, uh, you, you see a bit of a gap there, that little circle. So there's a bit of pullback risk for, for, the, for the chart, but I think longer term, this is a really, really good stock to, to own, even at the current share price levels. And lastly, TSMC, the biggest, uh, the world's biggest foundry. Again, uh, if you look at the share price uh, on, for, over the long term, there on the left, it's had a massive run. And you can see the, the double top there. That's the COVID peak when there was shortages for uh, for all sorts of semiconductors. More recently, chart on the right, you see that it's uh, after those uh, after that double peak, it's it's come down. It's close to the low end of the trading range, which is uh, is good. That's a circle there. So I think. Right now could probably be a, could, could be a good time to to get into that stock, um, and again looking at valuation, it's 0.32 uh, on our EV EBITDA to uh, EBITDA growth metric, with EBITDA margins of 69%. So again, you look at a stock here that is pretty cheap because investors are a bit scared to to jump in at the moment. Interest rates are still uh, are high. It might be we might see another raise, or it could be flat. But that in, in uncertainty in the market, I think, is what's keeping um, investors uh, back a little bit. And of course, the big, big, big risk for this one is that the China risk. Um, so all the uh, the, the war mongering, uh, all the, the the talk of getting Taiwan back into the fold in China. Uh, yeah, that is a, a clear and present danger, as uh, as one movie was called a long time ago, um, and it's 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 very it's very real uh, scenario where Taiwan gets invaded and that will disrupt the entire industry, uh, but of course specifically TSMC. So that's a risk with that one. Um, 
but overall, uh, this sector is, is live and kicking and happy days are almost back, I think, starting with memory, but logic will, will follow next year. So in my book, you need to get set uh, while you can, because at some point, this industry, the, the investors in this industry look about six to nine months ahead, right? So this is going to move before uh, you actually see these improvements coming through. And I think uh, probably now is, is a good time to, to jump in, Stuart. And Mark, uh, TSMC, obviously you put the, the uh, uh, stock ticker from Taipei there, but it's traded on NASDAQ as well, right? Exactly, yeah, you can buy it uh, on NASDAQ as well. Yeah, right. that's true for all these stocks. Right. And I think we'll, uh, we'll have to wrap it up there, Stuart. Any, uh, any final comments from you on this uh, beautiful day? So basically, uh, 2023 has not been a great year for, for markets generally for reasons that we've talked about in this, this interview. Mark, I, I get the sense of it that 2024 is going to be better. You'll, you'll see a turnaround in sentiment once we've realized the world's not falling apart, at least in an economic sense, uh, from, from, uh, from peak interest rates. Uh, so um, so as, we, as we get ready for 2024, investors ought to keep that in mind. There's, there's going to be a bottoming out at some point. It's coming sooner rather than later. Yeah, I agree. And, and so interest rates will be very important there. Um, I think these, these conflicts in Ukraine and Israel, uh, hopefully that's, that, that gets put to, to bed hopefully real soon, but I'm, I'm a bit more fearful for Ukraine in that respect. But um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of things going on in the world right now that have put investors uh, 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 on edge. And I think from that point of view, things should should be improving next year. So hopefully we, uh, we can see that come through uh, sooner rather than later. And I guess on that note, we've been talking for a long time, Stuart, especially me. <laughs> we should wrap it up here. <laughs> All right, stay bullish. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. See you next week.